but um, are you what are you kidding me now come on if uh, if Jenny is just being disruptive we'll have to have the have her be escorted from the um, uh, let's see uh, well I see Dawson on one page that's the first D and then I see so th- we have some people listed in here by the way who are people who are with us from around the world and then I see one an Andre de Beer who I know from New Zealand and then it goes right to Evans and Ewing and so I see no I see no Dunlap in here so oh it's com- it's in there together Oh, I see that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Foiled again. <laughs> well, if you would like to just black out this thing right here. <laughs> no, well, I'm glad to find that out because I was concerned after we had those printed that we hadn't put them in, actually. Got many wonderful comments on uh, Nathan's message last week, and I really appreciate him filling the pulpit last week. It was, uh, it was just a good time. It was an awesome time. A uh, couple of quick announcements for those of you who attend Caleb's uh, class with uh, <clears throat> James Allison on Sunday mornings. That'll be next Sunday, the Jesus the Forgiving Victim class. And, uh, and I want to say this, uh, when, and then on the 15th, which is a week from this coming Friday, uh, we will have our uh, forgiveness, uh, radical forgiveness Bible study at our home again. So that's the 15th, April the 15th. And you will probably be wanting to forgive the IRS or somebody that day, so... Uh, come on over there. <laughs> and <clears throat> and the, for those of you that have been attending on Sunday morning here at 8.30 on the once a month when Caleb does his class, um, he has only been giving us a kind of a, a quick, I don't know, um, over, o- overview of this uh, there. And I have ex- actually have all the DVDs. And what we're going to do is we're going to move our Friday night group into this as we fin- wrap up the Radical Forgiveness book of Brian Zahn's so that we will actually be watching one of James uh, and there are, several, there are many more than we've seen in the back room. So we will actually be watching one of uh, James Allison's uh, teachings on um, Jesus the Forgiving Victim uh, on Friday nights and then going into discussion there. So uh, we have a plan and then Caleb's class after one more lesson after this one we will be going on Sunday mornings uh, once a month to a um, um, who? Marcus Borg. And these will be more complete lessons. There are four of them, and we will do all four of them here. So Caleb wanted me to communicate that to you. Um, they, we've got a little bit of a, a, a stomach flu in our youngest grandchild, so they didn't come today. But anyway, um, praise God. Well, we're glad all of you are here today. Uh, and uh, those of you that uh, stayed home, <laughs> Say, well, I was here last week and the place was full, so I figured I could stay home this week. Praise God. You know, you don't know it, uh, but we do. We actually have a lot of people. We have people online with us right now from New Zealand, from Alaska. Uh, we, I spoke with a lady from Alaska yesterday on the phone or two days ago who's invited Marilyn and I to come up there. We have a small group of people that gather around our ministry up there in Kenai, Alaska, a town of about 7,000 people. And there's about eight of them that meet regularly and, and uh, fellowship with Father's House Materials. And one of them had gone, just had gone to India, you know, where there's billions of people, <laughs> had gone to India on a mission trip and went, into, went to a particular church over there. And uh, while he was in this church, uh, and you know how people are from other countries, they sometimes think if you live in America, you know everybody in America. <laughs> and this pastor walked up to him after he'd been in the service and asked him if he... Have you ever heard of Father's House Ministries in Colorado? This guy who's from Alaska said, this is amazing. Here we are, a small group. So there's people in Nepal who are part of our ministry, I guess, on Sunday mornings as well. So, uh, I mean, our Sunday morning, I don't know what it is over there. It's probably next week sometime over there. <laughs> but anyway, praise God. But it's awesome. You know, we have, we have connections, all of us do. You don't realize how many connections we have all over the world you know, through this ministry, and so it's exciting to me. So, anyway, praise God. Well, we are going to continue on in our message entitled, What's the Manna with You? And, of course, you all know now, Who's the Manna with You? would probably have been a better uh, title for this, but uh, anyway, we're going to continue on 
I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, uh, to the Isaiah chapter 55. And in just a moment, we're going to look at a very familiar scripture. And, um, but I want to start off by saying this, you know, we've all heard the saying, I know, you just be careful not to throw out the baby with the bathwater, you know. And yet, I wonder how many times we have actually discarded something very useful simply because the waters surrounding that something had been muddied by, the, by men, by the misuse or the abuses of men. And yet, there's something very uh, valuable in that water, and we have, in fact, thrown it out. And, and what I want to do today is talk about a little something that I think probably is maybe, let me say maybe, one of the most well-informed, well-documented um, uh, wisdom issues in Scripture. And it's one that you will be familiar to most of you because it has risen uh, in the past to, uh, to, to pretty uh, common communication or, uh, or a declaration in the church. But because of misuse and abuse and everything, it has kind of fallen away from the practice of people in the church. So we're going to talk about it today because I think it's really very important as we are talking about wholeness and, and soundness and, and wellness uh, in our lives. And, and, you know, we've talked about this concept that I've developed for you out of Genesis chapter 1 where it talks about, you know, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And I've told you that we are to understand, uh, and we'll explain why that is today too more, but that we are to understand that when, uh, when this commission was given to uh, our recorded ancestors of Adam and Eve in the very beginning, uh, that, that they were to understand not only the cosmos or not only terra firma, but that I also were to understand this earth, that this is their earth. But when I talk about this earth, I think I've said this before, but I want to make sure you don't re restrict that now just to your physical body. When I talk about our earth, I am talking about everything that falls within the, 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 uh, the, the, your uh, sphere of influence. And you and I each have an earth. We each possess a sphere of influence. Every one of us does. And uh, our earth, for instance, is uh, Marilyn and I are of one earth. And our children are of one earth. And, 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 and our finances are part of our earth. And our, you know, our relation. I mean, all of those things that fall within that sphere of influence uh, over which, uh, in, the, in this situation, Marilyn and I have the privilege of, of parenting or whatever, th that's our earth. So when I talk about our earth and the wholeness and the wellness and the soundness of our earth. I'm talking about more than just your physical body, even though I am also talking about your physical body. I'm talking about your children, your offspring, your finances, all of those things that God would have be well in your life, that God would have be firm and not infirm in your life. So again, we'll probably mention that again as we go on today. But, but as I said, what we're going to do today is kind of bring up again something that... Uh, to me, is probably the most well-documented, well-informed wisdom issue of the Scriptures. And you'll be very familiar with it when we get going. But if you'll go with me here in the 10th and 11th verse of Isaiah 55, we'll get started here. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, <clears throat> but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. All right, so first of all, let's look at verse 11. I'm sorry my voice is a little squeaky today. I've had a little bit of dryness going on here. I'll, I'll try to keep drinking in front of you. And Anyway, notice that he says in verse 10, my word shall accomplish what I please, and my word, is understood there, shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. All right, well, incidentally, just kind of as a side note, one of the psalmists in Psalm 107, verse 20, did give us one thing for which he sent it, among the many things for which he sent it. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. And so you can even take that word and you can say with regard to Psalm 107, verse 20, well, my word shall accomplish what I please and my word shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. But notice also, slipping back into verse 10, where he is obviously still talking about his word. He says, my word will give seed to the sower, and my word will give bread to the eater. We're going to begin to talk about this a little bit more today. It's like, yeah, this will be familiar to a lot of you, but it may be familiar to you as something that maybe you have kind of slipped away from, or that you've fallen away from, or that you've 
come to not value as, a, as an important uh, part of your experience. I'm going to start just by, and we're going to go through a lot of things here that you won't need to turn to because you'll be familiar with them. But when we go back, for instance, in Genesis 1, where it all begins, and we read there, we read, let there be and there was, or some similar language several times in the first chapter of Genesis. Let there be light and there was light. Let there be and there was. And we read that, and, and you know, almost immediately, I think most of us, because of the way we've been taught, we visualize those words suddenly taking upon visibility and substance, suddenly. That's what we've been taught. And you know, many times it's been emphasized that the literal Hebrew says something more like, light be, light was. And so that just further, you know, communicates to us the, we would say the probability of suddenly. But I'm going to suggest to you, and we'll talk more about it later, you know, that we may be in error with the assumption of suddenly, and that error may be hanging around today and still affecting our experience in what we're going to be talking about today. And as I said, that'll become clearer to you as, you go, as we go along. But let me continue on. So we have the let there be and there was. Now, in, again, you don't have to turn to these. Psalm 33, 6 says this, by the word of the Lord. Remember, my word, see, shall accomplish that for which I sent it, right? Okay. Psalm 33, 6 says, by the word of the Lord... The heavens were made, that word means cause to be, or what does it mean? It means to, to become and remain. So by the word of the Lord, the heavens beca- uh, were made to become and remain, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Then verse 9 says, for he spoke, and it was. He commanded, and it stood fast. And then, of course, Hebrews 11.3 that we've been working with several times in this series. By faith, we understand that the worlds were were framed or completed thoroughly by the word, the rhema, the utterance is what that word means, the utterance of God, so that the things that are seen, those things that have gained visibility and substance were not made out of that which is visible. We've talked about that verse over and over. But hey, once again, we have by faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared, framed, or completed thoroughly by the rhema, the utterance of God. The same thing we find in Genesis chapter 1, same thing we read there in Psalm chapter 33. All right, so we have these. And to, and to all of this, and this is where I want to kind of you know, give you some specific information here. To all of this, uh, Walter Brueggemann, who is known to be probably one of the foremost Christian scholars on the Old Testament, and here's what he says about these things that we've just talked about. The imagery is of a powerful sovereign who utters a decree from the throne, and in the very utterance, the thing is done. Now, you already have that imagery, don't you? Let there be and there was, right? Right? The word of the Lord, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, you know, by the word, breath of his mouth, for he spoke and it was. And so he says that the imagery is of a powerful sovereign who utters a decree from the throne and in or within the very utterance, the thing is done. This is what is known as a speech act, a speech act. In other words, where words are the vehicles of substance. Words are the vehicles of of manifestation or of substance, right? Now, once again, referring back to Genesis chapter 1, we we see there that humanity is actually the product of a speech act, aren't we? God said, let us make man, let us cause to become and remain man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion shortening verse 26, over all the earth, okay? That was a speech act. And so consequently, man became and remains, right? The image of God, according to the likeness of God, and has dominion over all the earth. So man is a product of the very speech act of God, is that right? And man is in the image of God, and more important, the likeness of God is with regard to what I'm gonna be talking about today. As my voice changes, I'm going through puberty. I'll be 70 in just a couple of weeks, and I'm finally going to get to my voice. It's finally going to change. (laughs) Praise God. Now, and then it says, then it says, me and one of my grandsons are going through the same thing right now. 
We're both getting older, too, so it's, it's, it's coincidental, isn't it? So after that, it says, Then the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. It says that in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. So he took this man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. How was he to attend it, to tend it and to keep it? Well, initially, it was in the same mode as his creator, right? In other words, he's going to tend and keep in the same way. N.T. Wright says this. <clears throat> this is very important. Within God's world, please hear this. This is another one of the foremost theologians in the world. Within God's world, one of the most powerful things human beings as God's image bearers on earth can do, is speak. Words change things. Now, that's important. See, because we've heard word of faith preachers say it. We've heard word of faith preachers with little or no education in theology say it. And they were correct. I'm not saying they weren't correct. But I'm saying, you see, we need to realize that there are people who have put a great deal of their, of their lives into, this, into scholarly work and into developing an understanding of, of, of these things. And this is what they say. So I'm going to read you that one more time. So N.T. Wright says, because I said, you know, God put this man that he had made into the Garden of Eden to tend it and keep it, and I asked how. And N.T. Wright answers that. Within God's world, which Eden was, Eden was called the Garden of God, Within God's world, one of the most powerful things human beings, as God's image bearers, can do is speak. Words change things. So he starts out tending and keeping, and then, of course, after the expulsion from the garden, it adds this, that now he must cultivate the land. And when it adds that now he must cultivate the land, what we need to understand is that now man is being identified as a sower. Before he was just tending and keeping, but now he's cultivating. So now man created in God's image according to his likeness, exercises his dominion on the earth, but now he is exercising that dominion as a sower of seed. Right? Okay. Now, Jesus, the true human, the perfect human, say, said these words. He said, the words that I speak, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. Now, why is that? Is that because he's God? No. No, not because he's God, but because he was fully human. Because he was the true human. Because he was the perfect human, say. And so, when we, when we read in John 6, 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Please do not think that that's because he was God. Because we're told that he emptied himself of his divine rights and privileges when he came to the earth. And even though he certainly was God, and that's in the one sense, he had, a, he had emptied himself of all of the privilege of just being God, and he had taken upon himself man. And so speaking as man and for men, he said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So we need to understand that the words that you and I speak are spirit. And we need to ask ourselves, but are they life? Hmm, okay. <clears throat> so words are seeds. Words are seeds, you know. And they're seeds that are containing specific substance needing only to be sown in order to begin to produce fruit. Right? Now, as I said, and as, you, as most of you know this, as I said, you know, I've done several whole series on just this concept. Because as I said already, this is probably one of the most well-informed, well-documented wisdom issues of Scripture. The tongue, the words of our mouth, based on God's words, and so on. Seeds and sowing and reaping. I mean, every biblical writer contains this, you know, shares this principle with us. Okay? <clears throat> So we really cannot afford, I want you to hear this, we cannot afford to ignore the biblical revelation of seed as it pertains to the wholeness of our earth. We can't afford to ignore it. Now go with me back to Genesis 1, 28 and 29, where we were the last time. Boy, 
Boy, I'm breaking in a new Bible in the pages. There we go. All right, then God blessed them and said, we've been through the, pr- the previous parts, but then God blessed them and said, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Now, I gave you a little more literal rendering of that last week, and I'll just figure that into into my repeat of this in just a moment. But anyway, as I said to you last week, you know, metaphorically, we need to be able to see that verse 29 is the provision for the fulfillment of verse 28. In other words, okay, he says in verse 28, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Well, how? See... I have given you every herb, and here's the literal, every herb sowing seed for all the face of all the earth. Right? So in other words, there's a metaphor here. And that is that I am giving you the the commission to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue. Now, subdue means to, to, to keep it in right relationship with you and with its created intended purpose. I mean, you look up the word subdue, and it says to trample down. It means to, you know, to, it, it kind of has an authoritarian sound to it when you look it up. But that's not what the word means in, in the context here. It means to keep the earth in its right relationship with its creative purpose. Now, so again, as I said to you last time, this is in reference, metaphorically, not only to greater earth, but also to lesser earth, to greater cosmos and to lesser cosmos, if you will. Your heavens and your earth as well as the heavens and the earth, okay? And uh, you'll understand a little bit better why I say that in just a moment here. But anyway, so, so again, understand verse 29 to be God's provision, see, for the fulfillment of verse 28. How are we going to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, right? How are we going to do that, okay? Well, he says, see, <laughs> it's simple, I have given you every herb sowing seed on the face of all the earth. Huh. And when it says, to this, this shall be to you for food at the end, well, don't discount what I've said because this word here that's translated food can also mean for judgment. In other words, for judging rightly, appropriately, in filling the earth and subduing it, for making right decisions. See? So if I'm going to judge the earth... I'm going to judge this earth. I'm going to judge this earth, for instance, as being in a place of out of relationship with its creative, right? I I judge this earth. I see that this earth is not walking in the place of its its ordained, you know, creative purpose. We'll, We'll just say sickness. That makes sense to all of you. Sickness. What am I going to do to change that? What am I go- what's going to be food for that? What is going to be the judgment of that? Well, he just said, see, I have given you. Every seed for sowing on all the face of your earth, right? To this, this shall be for you as for food or for provision for making the change. Does that make sense to you? Okay. All right. Now, here's what I want you to understand, which is what we need to get. Understand, please, that we are back reading into this. We are back reading into this, okay, from a huge accumulation of wisdom regarding this issue from both the Old and the New Testament. So we're back reading some things into this. In other words, if, if, if this were actually written when we originally thought it was written, you know, then uh, we might wonder how we could prop- possibly have a metaphorical application like I'm making to your body and your earth. But I'd like, you, I'd like to remind you of this or, or tell you of this if you didn't know it. The things that we're reading here in Genesis chapter 1 were not written until as late as 500 years before Christ. So many hundreds and thousands of years had transpired from the actual early stages of creation until this time when the scribes of Israel felt it necessary to, be, to, to get all this oral tradition written down in order to preserve the, their, their understanding. And so these things were not written until as, as late as 500 years B.C., 
maybe 600, but mostly probably closer to 500 BC. When they, so, so, we, so what, we, what that means to us is this. That means that, that the writers now then, as they pinned these things, as they pinned what we now call Genesis 28 and 128 and 29, as they wrote these things, they had generations, hundreds of years of acquired understanding of the way things are and the way things work. In other words, as they wrote, they understood some things that maybe they would not have understood you know, from, uh, the, if, if it had been written back then, right? In other words, these scribes, they had both the understanding of literal and metaphorical application by now. Israel wrote almost exclusively in metaphor. They were explaining everything in metaphor for the most part. But so these scribes would have had both literal understanding and, and metaphorical applications. They would have understood these words. Let me put it this way. They would have understood these words, you know, to be true of both terra firma and of your personal earth. They would have understood these words of verse 29 as being both those words which would, in fact, affect wheat harvest and would also make babies. See what I'm saying? The sowing of seed. They would have understood them to be both botany and biology side by side. All right? Now, that's literal, obviously. But they also would have developed over the years, would have had this understanding that had come to them of, of the metaphorical applications for both spiritual and natural life. Now think about it. These are the guys. I want you to consider some of the other things that these fellows. Now again, I'm I'm acting as though they're one small group sitting at a table. I don't mean that, but the input uh, from when these things were written. These are the fellows who, for instance, penned uh, what we now recognize as Genesis 8:22, where it says, <clears throat> "While the earth remains, everybody touch your earth." Okay. In acknowledging the, the greater earth, we also want to acknowledge the lesser earth, right? While the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. What's that say? As long as I'm walking and breathing in this earth, seed time and harvest is a principle that I need to be, that I am engaged in. It shall not cease. It doesn't say I can stop it. It says it shall not cease. So in other words, my words are a constant source of seed time and harvest, right? Right? The words that I speak to you, they are spirit, and they're squeaky, <clears throat> and, <clears throat> but are they life? Do they need oil? <laughs> are they life? See what I'm saying? We need to understand this, though. It's so important, because as long as the earth remains, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest will not cease. All right, well, these writers were not just simply recounting you know, God's promise after the flood of, of the fact that there would always be crops growing upon the earth. That was in there too. But there's more being said because they now had the metaphorical. Think about this. They were, they were men who at this time who would have understood, for instance, from the Proverbs, my words are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. See, there's a metaphorical application right there too. My words are life to those who find they would have also been those who understood death and life are in the power of the tongue. See, I mean, I could go on all day long with scriptures that talk about, that, that share the wisdom of the tongue. See what I'm saying? And so, <clears throat> they would have also known the words that somebody from among their group of scribes had attributed to God speaking to Joshua that we're all familiar with. My word shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Then you will make your way prosperous. Then you shall have good success. See, these are words that were attributed to God, having been spoken to Joshua as he took over. He would be strong and of good courage, right? And then he said, my word shall not depart from your mouth. Now, I know it says in, 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 Gen, in uh, Joshua 1.8, it said this book of the law, but we need to understand it now in the light of Jesus as the word, right? But my, but my word shall not depart from your mouth. What's that mean? It shall always be in your mouth. It shall not, your mouth shall never be void of my word. That doesn't mean quoting scripture. We'll get more onto that in a little bit. But anyway, so as I said, you know, <laughs> <clears throat> they, they very clearly put all of this together 
And, and it, it's, it's, the understanding is, is there. It's unquestioned. The word, the seed, the tongue, right? So we can't afford to ignore or, or to discount, you know, the, the great body of wisdom regarding the effects of our words on our lives. We can't afford to discount it. Now, undoubtedly, you know, there have been many who have been scarred by misuse. And this is why many people have, some people have tried to push these things aside and will no longer acknowledge them because they've been in places where this had become such a uh, religious ritual where it was nothing more than a by rote thing, quoting scripture all the time. Uh, it, and, it's, and it sadly has even been used to judge people. You know, well, your confession's not right. You know what I'm saying? And so what I'm really suggesting is that we understand this privately for a while. And that we don't, this, this isn't to become something by which we judge other people or, or crit, uh, crit, critique other people's language. This is just something that we need to understand. We're, we're talking about setting our earth right. And in setting our earth right, greater earth receives the benefit as well, right? Because man has dominion over all the earth. And how is that, that dominion to be exercised? Well, first and foremost, dominion is a speech act. It's not the only thing it does, but it is, first and foremost, a speech act. Because we see that's how God created it. Isn't that right? Okay, so, so as I said, you know, misuse has been common. I would be the first to admit that. We were, you know, for years involved in Word of Faith, and, and we observed the abuses of, of pastors and other Christians upon one another with regard to this positive confession message and stuff like that. So try to divorce yourself from that way of thinking right now and just hear where we're going with this right now because we can't afford to ignore it. And let me say this too. Misuse is no excuse for disuse, right? You don't quit driving your car because some other clown drives down the highway carelessly, say. You might. You might not drive there. You know. So, the, the, but the wisdom in support of speech acts is overwhelming in the scripture. It really is. Okay. Think about these things. You know, how is the surface of the terra firma renewed? You know, except by the perpetual sowing of the seed that is in the plants that have themselves grown from seed. Right. How is the how is human population sustained except by the sowing of the seed of man who has himself grown from the seed of his own father? And mother, of course, I'm not discounting that. But anyway, so, so then, metaphorically speaking, then how are we, you know, to fill? And let, let, me, let me give you this, this word fill, fill the earth. Let me give you this word, this defi these definitions again that go with this word. This is what the word means. Confirm, validate, fulfill, satisfy, set apart, strengthen, establish, and renew. So we see that all of those are words that are contributing to a better earth, Right? A better natural earth, a better physical earth. All right? So how are we to confirm, validate, fulfill, satisfy, set apart, strengthen, establish, and, and renew our personal earth except by sowing the seed, right, that he has given to us for all the face of our earth, for all our sphere, uh, sphere, sphere of influence. Get on a roll with what... <laughs> anyway. Now, Luke 8.11... It says this, it just says, the seed is the word or the logos of God. Not rhema here, but logos. The seed is the logos of God or the word of God. That's Luke's, in Luke's rendition of the parable of the sower, obviously. But anyway, so in other words, the seed that satisfies and strengthens and renews the face of our personal earth is the revelation given us, provided us by the logos himself. Right? That's the seed. That's the seed. In other words, whatever is granted to us by him or whatever agrees with the purpose, the work, and the ministry of the word made flesh is the seed for sowing upon all of our earth. As I said, you know, he's, the, he's your bread for eating. He said that. I'm the bread of life, right? He's the manna with you, <laughs> and he's always with you. Again, we're not trying to coax something from some alien spirit world over here into the natural world to make our bodies well. He said, I am with you to the end of the age. That's right. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know? He said, you have been born of incorruptible seed of the living and abiding logos of God. You're born of his seed. It's his seed within you. And so whatever 
is the seed of the Logos, is seed for sowing in all of our earth. So let me, let me simplify it, though, because for you like this. If, if the testimony of Jesus, I'm just going to give you some quick examples. If the testimony of Jesus is that healing is the children's bread, that was the testimony of Jesus to the Syrophoenician or the Canaanite woman. Healing is the children's bread. So if the testimony of Jesus is that healing is the children's bread, and if the witness of his work in ministry came to be, as Peter quoted it, by his stripes you were healed. Well, then this is what? This is seed for sowing upon all of our earth. All right? He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. So this is the seed that we should be sowing upon our earth. Healing is the children's bread. And I hope something, you know, uh, maybe some of you are, I don't want to say that, that sounds like I'm talking down to you. I, I hope some of you have read somewhere, you know, how the, the, the overwhelming evidence that they have nowadays in medical science that the cells of your body actually respond to the words of your mouth. See what I'm saying? Now, remember, they respond to the words of your mouth, the words of your mouth, all the words of your mouth. Right? And, uh, you know, a long time ago, and it was, done in, it was done to be humorous, but a man that some of you know, Dave Duell, said, said one time when, he, when he, was, he was preaching here, in fact, well, not in this building, but in another place, and, and he said, uh, um, he was actually taking the words of Acts, I think it's 27, out of context at first, where Paul standing before Agrippa, and he says, I think myself happy to stand before you. And he just said, he stopped it off with, I think myself happy. Well, that's a good thing to do because there's a man thinking, so is he. But then he talked about how he was talking a little bit about how the, uh, this whole concept of how the cells of our body actually do respond to the words of our mouth. I did a huge series on called Grace Tones that if you haven't listened to it, you should listen to it. It goes into more specifics. And I don't want to spend six weeks on this. I'm just going to talk about it this week and maybe a little bit next week and chop it off here. But, but anyway, and, 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 and what he did was he, he, he said, uh, well, I wake up in the morning and I, and I, I, I said, oh, man. I feel terrible. And he said, my cells look at each other and say, do you hear that? We feel terrible. Pass it on. (laughs) And he said, in just a matter of hours, I was back in bed. Yeah. See what I'm saying? You know, I've got bank bank tellers and other people that when I come in, because I've I've been doing this for so long, and it doesn't always feel true. People say, how are you doing? I said, I'm awesome. I started doing that about 15 years ago. And I got people all over town now doctor's office, the nurse, you know, when I went for my annual checkup and stuff. Oh, hi, awesome. See? And, I know, and I, I, originally, I thought it was my looks. But then I realized that she had just gotten accustomed to my declaration. Anyway. Then I looked in the mirror, and I realized that couldn't be it. Yeah. But anyhow, so let's do some more, though. But that's the seed for sowing. Okay, by his stripes, I was healed. Now, again, I'm not talking about you know, making this a judgment between you and anybody else. I'm just talking about, hey, this is what my my, my earth needs to hear. Jesus said, earth, that healing is the children's bread. See? Jesus said, earth, that by his stripes we were healed. Right? The Father said, speaking as the Logos, I sent my word and healed you and delivered you from. Now, I want you, I want again to, to keep emphasizing this. Healed indicates you're in a position of needing it. Right? So we're never talking about, oh, you're going to get to the point where you don't encounter anything bad or evil. Well, then Jesus and Paul were both total failures. Yeah. Right? Okay. But, but in circumstances, like I said last week, rest is not a position that guarantees you to never have any issues. Rest is a place that we can occupy in the midst of issues because we know. All right? All right? Listen to this one. If, if he says that peace, love, and forgiveness, you know, are, are seeds of wholeness for both the greater cosmos and for my personal life, then these are the kind of seeds that I need to be sowing into my earth. I need to go ahead and, and because I have Jesus actually speaking some of these things, I can look at my earth and I can say, peace I give you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. My peace I give you. See, I can say that. I can, say to my, I can say to myself, when, when things begin to rise up, you know, in me, and, and uh, you've offended me, or, or I think you've offended me, I can say, you know, forgive the sins of any. 
Just forgive the sins of it. Now, I don't know how much you, you know, I actually do this to myself. I actually remind myself when I start to get here, forgive. It's better for you. It's good for you. If I feel better. Well, when I didn't used to forgive, and which I don't always do. I'm, I'm not perfect by any means. But when I, used to, when I used to not forgive, I'd get stomach issues and, and I'd be anxious and irritated all day about things. You know what I'm saying? And now I'm just sweet and cuddly all the time. It's, it's just made a heck of a difference. Hey. I say to myself, Seriously, when I read some of the atrocities that are going on in the world, love your enemies. See, this is seed, and it's seed. You know what seed is? Seed is substance in its early stages. It's not the finished work right away. It's something that needs to be sown into my life in order for there ever to be evidence of a finished work. Isn't that right? Okay. We can go on and on with this, but as I, as I said to this young lady back here who so very much wants to have a child, you know, God said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And so you see, those are seeds to, the bar- to her barren earth. Isn't that right? And so I would say to my body, you know, be fruitful, multiply. See what I'm saying? It's okay to talk to your body like that. Your body hears you. And listen, your body wants to be a blessing to you. Your body really does. Your finances want to bless you. Your relationships want to bless you. Not those people you're related to, but your relationships. They want to bless you. And the only way they'll ever do that is when, you see, the relations themselves are changed and so on. All right? But maybe more than anything else, you know, Fear, fear not, is something that I need to, you know, speak consistently to my earth. My earth that seems to fear anything and everything. Every potential possibility that rises before me. Maybe I need to learn to say say to my body, fear not. not." My my, my finances, they they fear. You know what I'm saying? My relational security, it fears. There's so many things that fear. I fear my wife's going to leave me. I don't. But I mean, I fear my wife's going to leave me. I fear my husband's going to leave me. I fear this. I fear that. I fear I'll never have children. I fear this. I fear that. See what I'm saying? We are, a, as I said to you a week or so ago, we, we are a church, sadly, not, this, not FHM, but I mean, we're a church, sadly, who is still dwelling in fear. The fear of death has encapsulated us once again. And yet Jesus destroyed him who had the fear of death who had the power of death that is the devil to release those who through fear of death were subject all their lifetime to bondage Amen. so we ought not to be subject to any bondage Amen. it's like Caleb said you know t- talking to me about you know I, I don't want to get into this but I mean it, it, the, the po- political thing but you know it doesn't make any difference who of this vast array of horrible choices that we have Scripture says the government is on his shoulders. And so my government will remain upon his shoulders. Now, I can succumb to fear of what might happen if this, that, or the other person is elected, you know. I can succumb to all all manner of fear about when Social Security runs out and all of these other things. Or I can remember that the government is upon his shoulder, that he is my provision, that he is the bread of life, that he's the manna with me. See? Okay. So anyway, I could, like I said, I could go on and on and on with that, and I don't want to, but, but here's the thing. Begin with the record. If you're trying to decide what kind of seeds do I need to sow, begin with the record. This, the record, the scriptures is what I mean. The scriptures are not the Logos, but the scriptures speak of the Logos, and they reveal the Logos. See what I'm saying? And so we discover what the Logos, what agrees with the revelation of the Logos. Okay. And those are the things. And then you continue on with the hearing ear that we've talked about. Well, what does the Lord say? What does the Lord say? I just, again, we just want to challenge you to just once in a while try this out. Try this out. Try turning off all the noise around you and saying with regard to whatever, Lord, what do you say? Now, I don't do it all the time. We don't do it all the time. But we are doing it more and more and more as we get older. Because we're realizing more and more 
how little we have to say about anything that's going to be productive without being what he has to say. Right? Okay. James said this, and you've all heard it. The tongue, everybody stick out your tongue. I know you've all been wanting to do that anyway. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. And that is, by the way, the Greek word soma. For those of you who doubted me. (laughs) The tongue is set among our members, is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. Listen, and sets on fire the course of nature, which means our natural experiences. Now, he was not saying that the tongue could not bless. He was speaking in a particular context, and he was letting them know what they were doing to themselves with their tongue from a negative perspective. He could just as well have said, the tongue is so set among our members that it blesses the whole body and gives life to the course of nature. See? But he was dealing with with a misuse over there, right? So why would we want to defile when we can bless? And when, when we have, again, the witness of Scripture here that the tongue is what defiles our body. And something? Now, I know there's processes behind all of these things. I know that, you know, we, we, have, we have succumbed, uh, you know, many years of life. We've succumbed to, to, to expectations that we voice without thinking about it sometimes. You know, things that we don't, we don't just come right out and say, well, <laughs> I'm going to get cancer. Some people do. I'm sad to say that. I've heard people say, well, my mother had it, my grandmother had it, I'll have it, or whatever, you know. But that, that's just plain stupid when you understand that the tongue defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of your nature. And that, that's a belief system that, that really just ruins us, folks. But I know we don't all just say that, or I'm going to have heart disease, and some people say that too, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. My, my finances are going to fail. Some people say that. I mean, see... A lot of it has to do with, with what we voice based on our expectations. But some of the things we have just grown so accustomed to that we are agreeing with them without actually fully verbalizing them. But why not begin to sow the seeds into our earth that will also benefit greater earth, right? Based on the fact that the tongue is so set among our members that it blesses the whole body and gives life to the course of our nature of our natural course of life. Isn't that good? But anyway, in the light of what he said, we need to realize that fear words, hatred words, retributive words, anxious words defile the whole body. And I won't go there, but you can find that over in Matthew chapter 15. Jesus said it's not what's in, what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a man, for that comes from his heart. And this is what, and it talks about murder and and false witness and a bunch of things over there, okay? One final thing for today, and then I will... uh, and we'll wrap it up for today. But I said back at the beginning that our imagination of instantaneous visibility, you know, and substance in response to let there be, you know, our, our way we visualize the, 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 the response to God's words, let there be, our imagination of it being instantaneous, you know, and, and visible right away might very much be a, an erroneous assumption that really is complicating our own experience today. Now remember this. The seed for sowing principle is a God principle. I want you to get this, first of all. What do I mean by a God principle? This is a principle of God's own working and God's own doing. It's a God principle. In other words, sowing seed is not a man principle. It's a God principle given to man by God. Understand it this way. What I mean is this. As we are introduced to both the literal and the metaphorical aspects of seed time and harvest, okay, we're actually being tutored in the likeness of God whose image we are. Or, in other words, we could say it this way. We're apprenticing under Father until like Father, like Son becomes our own experience. So we're apprenticing under Father, under father right? Right? And so we need to realize that this, is, that this is characteristic of his working. And we're simply being taught the facts of creation, perpetuation, <laughs> and preservation. 
It's his working. All right? Now, you may not be able to hear this now, and that's okay if you, if you aren't. But let me say this. There is almost no, well, first of all, evidence. There's, there, there is almost no evidence. There's no evidence, I should say. And there's almost no belief remaining among Christian and Jewish scientists, scholars, anthropologists, archaeologists. There's almost no belief remaining that God's words were instantaneous in their, in their finality of substance. In other words, nobody except the evangelicals who are afraid to give it up for, for some reason. Nobody believes the earth is only 7,000 years old. Nobody. But amongst these Christian Jewish scholars and, and scientists, and I mean true Christian people, people that are, have gone about the business of trying to prove the literal aspects of the Bible at times, have now realized that, no, the, the, there were not seven 24-hour days to the creation, that the world is many more thousands of years older, or hundreds of thousands of years older, possibly, the world itself. And so here's the agreement that they have. Yes, everything is a result of the words that God spoke, but rather than immediate, they were progressive in their development. Now, you can accept that or not, but I'm going to tell you that the seven-day, 24-hour poof theory of, of creation doesn't work. It is not in agreement with the law of creation. The law of creation is, is expressed to us in the seed for sowing principle. That's the principle of creation. How are you going to create new in your life? How are you going to create through this principle of sowing and reaping, of seed sown? So yes, the belief is <laughs> that all things are the product of his words in the same way that all harvests are the process of an earlier sowing. Yes, there's no, there's no question among truly Christian scientists and, you know, that, that God's words initiated the whole thing. As I told you before, people that are Christians that are beginning to understand quantum science, quantum physics, are realizing that at the root that they've called quark and they've tried to give other names at the root of all existence, is this thing that they haven't been able to identify in secular science, but now the Christian science, it's the word of God. It's that, as the scripture says, that holds all things together. It's the binding agent of all things. It's the initiating agent of all things. No question about it. But rather than this instantaneous imagination, let there be, and there was. Well, there was, but it didn't say in that instant it was. It said there was. See, we really have to stop and consider some of the things that we have been so solidified in that we may be actually damaging our ability to operate within this thing successfully. Because, as I said, you know, <coughs> this, you know, poof theory, I just call it the poof theory, I don't know what everybody else calls it, you know, of creation is not in harmony with the laws of perpetuation and renewal. And in fact, what it does is it presents man with an unusual, an unreal expectation because, poof, almost never happens. And when it doesn't, okay, the greater susceptibility is to discouragement and hopelessness. And if you haven't experienced that, you really haven't lived very long. And so what that really does is that tells us that our likeness, that likeness is being buried under difference. We're created in the likeness of God, not different from God. Ye are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. I said... I said, Jesus said, I said, John chapter 10, I said, ye are gods and all of you are sons of the most high. What's that mean? Does that mean you're sovereign? No, it just mean you're the offspring. We also are his offspring. In him we live and move and have our being. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. See, so likeness is a major thing in understanding how this all works. And when I see poof, but I don't see poof, <laughs> What it does is that lends itself to discouragement and hopelessness and, and a walking away from, a saying, as so many of these young theologians are saying today, and I speak out to them when I hear them, you know, some of them I'm related to, this, I don't believe this healing stuff anymore. Well, I'm sorry you don't, because you're wrong. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Would you say you need to get old? No, I said amen. Oh, yeah, I thought you said so. 
Oh, go. <laughs> but you see, <laughs> oh, I already am old. Never mind. <laughs> I, I took my cue a little too late. <laughs> no, you see, what happens is people throw out the baby with the bathwater. You know, another thing, uh, Hagen used to say this, I liked it. He said, you'll never see a counterfeit $3 bill because there's no real $3 bill, right? So where, where we have a counterfeit expression or a misapplication or a misuse, that can't exist apart from a seed of truth somewhere there. See what I'm saying? And what I want people to do, well, well let me go on here just a little bit. I'm almost through. I'll tell you what. Go with me over to Mark chapter 4. Because as I said, our, we, we end up with our likeness being buried under difference. And that's not what we want. We want to be encouraged. He wants us to be encouraged. He wants us to be able to go on. So recognizing divine, the, the divine replication that's being given to us, you know, that guarantees a harvest. Look at Mark chapter 4. Probably many of you could quote this. I could too, but and we're, we're going to read it so you'll see it. Because this is really where... My whole desire to be in the ministry started right here. Yep. Verse 26. The kingdom of God is as if. All right, here, listen to me now. Kingdom means reign or the sovereign rule of. So let's put it that way. The, the sovereign rule of God is as. In other words, Jesus is about to tell us about the reign or the rule of God in our lives or the reign and the rule of the words of the sovereign God in our mouth. Right? He says the kingdom of God is as if. A man should scatter seed on the ground. This is the way the kingdom of God works, folks. So this is a God principle being expressed to us. This is not a secondary principle. This is a first principle. A principle of creation, preservation, and sustenance. Okay? The kingdom of God... The sovereign reign of God, the sovereign working of God is as a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. I have to know how or I can't believe it. By faith we understand. Oh, wait a minute. For the earth. Okay, everybody touch your earth. Okay. I keep doing that, but I've got to keep reminding us. The earth yields crops, look at these next words, by itself. You mean without me worrying about it? Or No. He said the man goes to bed at night, sleeps by night, and rises by day. And the seed sprouts and grows. How? He does not know. For the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the head. After that, the full grain in the head. This is why I've told people for years as we've attempted to help people through some serious situations, you have to note every incremental change in a good way. You can't be overlooking the incremental looking for the harvest. You've got to say, look, it's growing. It's growing. Now, I know this isn't always good news for those kind of people, for people that are experiencing intense pain like our Lindsay is. And, and thing. I know this isn't always good news. I don't mean it. And there's more to be said about this. I'm just trying to get us started on a pathway of, of, of a future harvest that is going to provide us with a much better way of life. Okay? But look at verse 29. But when the grain ripens, or the King James says, when the crop permits... Immediately, he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. This is a God principle. This is the way the world was created. This is what took place in Genesis chapter 1. Because the sovereign rule of God, the sovereign working of God is this, as a man casts seed upon the soil. And God cast those words out of his mouth, and as he said, those words would accomplish what he intended them to accomplish, and they did, right? And then the last thing I want to mention to you here is that, and why don't you turn over to just Genesis 8, 22, just real quick so that you can see the problem that I'm about to put back into agreement with what Jesus just said in Mark chapter 4. Genesis 8, 22. <clears throat> it says something like, while the earth remains, now notice, please look at these words, seed time and harvest. 
That's, that seems to say two things. It's very confusing because it is not seed time harvest. It is seed time harvest, right? We all realize that, I hope. And see, this is a difficult thing. We have to, we have to embrace this. While the earth remains, while my earth remains, seed, time, and harvest. Now, I, when I go this, I don't mean to make it seem insurmountable. I refer back many times to the fact that when I was planting one of our first gardens when we first got married, I was reading on the back of the thing, because this was new to me. I'd never done agriculture before. And I'm reading on the back of those seed packages, and I'm finding out, good Lord, these squash aren't going to come to table for 70 days. Ah, radishes, 23 days. See, different things come to harvest in the natural. Things come to, come to, to, to harvest sooner, right? So I do this. I'm not trying to say, it's hopeless. No. But seed, time, harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer. Look at all the seasonal stuff. And day and night shall not cease. So just keep that in mind. Seed, time, harvest. That's what Jesus said. He goes to bed at night. He gets up by day. The seed sprouts up, sprouts up and grows. How he himself does not know, right? But the earth brings forth crops all by itself. First the blade, then the ear. King James, then full corn in the ear, and when the crop permits, immediately he puts in the sickle for the harvest has come, right? James said this. James said, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Waits. I hate that word. See, <laughs> see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently. Oh, well, I've never done that in my life. For it. Until it receives the early and the latter rain. The words of your mouth provide the rain too, kid, kiddo. You, you, uh, you also be patient. And then he says, establish your hearts. And Paul said it this way in conclusion. Let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Let us not grow weary. And I've said this a million times. I grew so much weary. My, <laughs> I, just, I was planting weary and it was growing. And you can plant weary and it'll grow, folks. You know that? Because the words of our mouth are seeds. Seeds containing specific substance. The substance of what you're saying is within those seeds. And it will grow. This is not some mystical do 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 thing we're trying to sow here. This is a, as I said, the most well-documented wisdom issue in the scriptures throughout. Did you get anything out of that? Amen. All right. Good. All right. The final thing, I, my final announcement, and I had saved it for the end. Because I mentioned it a couple weeks ago and nobody responded. And we want to make sure that you have the opportunity if you want to. Caleb is going to be starting, if there's an interest, uh, a home Bible study just uh, once or twice a month. Probably on Wednesday nights right now on how to read the Bible. And I really believe it would be beneficial. I'm, I'm planning on going because he's, he's just teaching me a lot of good stuff. And I'm excited about it. And I'm following it up with my own study. And, and you know, because I don't just take something a man says and... You know, I follow it up with my own study. But anyway, Caleb said, if you, want to, if you have any interest in, in this Bible study, then come into Caleb's house uh, you know, once or twice a month uh, for a how to read the Bible discussion, interactive thing, then please let me know today because he's not going to schedule it if nobody's interested, obviously. So let me know today so I can let him know that there's a few people that might be interested. He doesn't care how many it is. He wants to keep it small. So um, but we just don't want it this small. Nobody. Amen.